I think first, burnout is something everyone faces today. It's not isolated to surgeons or nurses. It doesn't matter what your endeavor is. It's occasionally very difficult to bring our best day in and out every time. warning signs a physician may be experiencing Dr. Burnout. How are some nonprofits affected by Dr. Burnout? What can members of the CHD community do to try to reduce Dr. Burnout? Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna. I am Anna Jaworski and the mother of an adult with a single ventricle heart. That's the reason I am the host of your program. I'm really excited to have Dr. John Calhoun on Heart to Heart with Anna today. Today's show is Dr. John Calhoun on Dr. Burnout in the CHD community. Dr. Calhoun is both a congenital and adult cardiac surgeon and was my heart warrior surgeon. He also wrote the foreword for my first book, Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a Handbook for Parents. Dr. Calhoun is the professor and founding chair of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center and is also the director of the Congenital Heart Center in San Antonio, a partnership of UHS and UTH. Over the years, his interests and expertise have included complex congenital heart surgery, heart and lung transplantation, less invasive cardiac surgery, and improving education and patient care. He has served as a president of many national cardiac associations and is currently president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the largest heart and lung specialty organization in the world. He helped found Heart Gift San Antonio, an organization that sponsors charitable, life-saving congenital heart repair on kids from around the globe. Dr. Calhoun is married to his wife, Sarah, and together they have four children, Satchel, Stetson, Sevi, and James. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Dr. Calhoun. Anna, so, so great of you to have me. I'm looking forward to our time. Me too. This is long overdue. Well, let's start by identifying exactly what Dr. Burnout is and what some of the warning signs are. Thank you. I think first, burnout is something everyone faces today. It's not isolated to surgeons or nurses. It doesn't matter what your endeavor is. It's occasionally very difficult to bring our best day in and out every time. However, several changes in our lives seem to be making this even more prevalent. One is the isolation the pandemic has caused. Another is the decreasing socialization that's been facilitated by increasing nonverbal communication. You know the problems. Twitter, Mm -hmm. Facebook, texting, email, you name it. Mm -hmm. Finally, a big issue that derives from this is the ever-increasing loss of filter that's allowed. People criticize people because it's no longer Mm face-to-face. These are ubiquitous things. But medicine has had it in some ways worse. Our surgical schedules were decimated by the pandemic. Appropriately, as physicians, we had to focus all resources on the treatment of life-threatening lung failure caused by the virus covid Mm-hmm. Our surgeons were pressed into service to assist with things we never really enjoyed, but were morally bound to. Similarly, nurses, residents, and allied health professionals all were pressed into the same endeavors. Before the vaccine, we were all scared we might be next and die from trying to fulfill our calling and our oath. Mm-hmm. It affected everyone in medicine. So yeah. many difficult decisions. Did you take call when you had diseases or conditions? that puts you at increased risk? How do you deal with patients that did not take a vaccine and became ill? Who should live and who should be left to medical treatment when it might essentially be futile, a death sentence? Withholding care and triaging patients with deadly disease was not something most of us had considered, much less addressed. For me, I guess burnout's when you just find yourself without the drive to go to work. You have trouble getting up. Yeah, You feel depressed, or you contemplate even worse, mm-hmm. and it's impacted all of us in some fashion. The last couple of years with the pandemic, now Ukraine, mm-hmm. in my neck of the woods in San Antonio, we've had some really crazy gun violence, yeah. and all of this has brought more and more to our collective forefront and attention, the problem of just being afraid, just being worn out. Mm-hmm. As a head of the cardiothoracic department, the 
UT UHS Pediatric Heart Center and STS, or the Society for Thoracic Surgeons. I know you understand the significance of Dr. Burnout. How has Dr. Burnout affected you? I mean, you just told me some ways, but can you tell me specifically how it's affected you? Absolutely, Anna. For me, it's been about pace, trying to find a little balance in my life, or at least carve some out, and trying to identify a better spiritual compass. Mm. I've really focused on being good to myself and my family, working to find time for both, to prescribe a little exercise for myself, and to create time for my wife and my children. Similarly, I have to find time to set an example for my team, because if I don't, they suffer. There's no question that I exist in a state of excitement about the challenges we face and the balance that we need with these realizations. But I need a break at times, Mm -hmm. and that's where the pace comes in. Sometimes I know I need a longer break, but just not yet. Certainly, it's been with a great deal of help and counsel from my friends, colleagues, and family. Mm-hmm. It's offered me that sometimes the interactions with your colleagues or patients just go poorly. Yeah. And it may be a result of their struggles. Mm-hmm. This is something I've emphasized for my team. When we meet with patients and when we interact with nurses or other healthcare professionals, they're having the same things we are. Mm-hmm. The administrators are experiencing the same struggles we are. Mm-hmm. This is why I say that I've tried to find a little more spiritual compass. This do unto others as you'd have done unto you works. And thinking about the other person's problems as you are trying to address your own is something that's helped me and I think helped our team. Well, I've always been impressed with how cohesive your team is. You work in a very high-stress field, and yet my son had surgery 17 years apart and had the same anesthesiologist, some of the same nurses. You were his surgeon for all three of his surgeries, even though they were 17 years apart. You have to be doing something right for people to want to stay with you, even though you do work in a really high-stress area. Well, thank you. We've been fortunate that I kind of got aligned with good people to begin with. And when I went off to Boston, that same anesthesiologist you're referring to went to Boston herself and spent time on her own kind of learning what they were doing so we could bring it back as a group and create a team. Mm -hmm. It was her commitment, Dr. Debbie Rash's commitment, to the program that's helped. And along the way, since I've kind of been the boss, I get to hire everybody. And every now and then, I get to be the one to tell them they fired themselves because I don't fire many people. But you do have to actively manage a team, and you can't always be a nice guy and still have the kind of team you want when people are not, after multiple times, able to do things that you need them to do. Sometimes they need to find somewhere else, and sometimes you have to help them do that. So I appreciate the comments about the team. Just this morning, I had a conference call with all of our nurses and just listened. Just listened to their problems, their concerns, the issues they're facing, which are the same ones we're all facing. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's something that has always impressed me. You're a very good listener. Like when I told you that I needed a book, I needed a resource, and you told me that you had been asking the nurses to do it, but the nurses really didn't have time to do it. So when I said I would do it, you were so sweet to accept the challenge of writing the foreword for my book, and I really, really appreciate that. So you're a really great listener. Okay, so I have one more question in this segment, and that is... According to an article published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, mission-focused executives, nonprofit employees, teachers, principals, nurses, and physicians are some of the most at-risk people for burnout. So how does Dr. Burnout affect heart gift or the STS? Well, it affects both. Heart gift has been really difficult because the pandemic ground it to a halt. Mm-hmm. The model we had involved having local philanthropists donate money to bring kids in that couldn't get surgery in their country Mm -hmm. and really didn't have it available. But with the pandemic, all travel was impossible. Mm -hmm. We had so many problems with having someone have a negative COVID test, have to quarantine for a period of time, be able to do them, hospital resources redeployed to other areas that for a couple of years, hard gift just 
had to hold off, but it's now back. We have done several kids this year, and we have a benefit tournament this weekend. The STS has had similar difficulties for two years. Our annual meeting was canceled, and we had to switch, figure out how to do a virtual meeting, figure out how to put on most of our sessions in a very collaborative virtual way. And as you might imagine, it's very difficult to have question and answer when someone presents a paper and to orchestrate that when you have potential for two or three, 400 people asking questions. So we had to have a chat room, a moderator, someone to track the questions, someone to select them and to funnel those questions to the speaker. So we had some semblance of the same kind of thing that we had in person. We right. learned a lot about virtual meetings, as everyone has, mm-hmm. and it's really helped the STS put on some great sessions. The two gentlemen that were ahead of me at the leadership role of the STS, Dr. Duraney and Dr. Grondon, both did a great job of communicating to our members at first almost weekly about what they were doing and hearing their problems and hearing solutions from other hospitals. So I knew what was going on in some of the great hospitals around the country and around the world and how they were dealing with nurse shortages, supply chain mm-hmm. shortages, mm-hmm. salaries. Oh, my goodness. You know, yeah. How did you keep your staff together with no money coming in and lots of expense going out? It was very difficult. I'm really proud of our hospital and our dean. They did mm-hmm. a great job. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home Tonight Forever. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The opinions expressed in the podcast are not those of Hearts Unite the Globe, but of the hosts and guests, and are intended to spark discussion about issues pertaining to congenital heart disease or bereavement. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Dr. Calhoun, do you feel that there are any personal qualities that attract medical professionals to the cardiac surgical field that might also make them at risk for burnout? I'm sure that's very true, Anna, unfortunately. My colleagues and I are all just a little bit crazy, some of them more than others, but it's really crazy. During the pandemic, for much of it, I was on call every night. I didn't have a partner. I was available all the time. Oh, wow. And that 24-7 commitment to your practice is fatiguing in and of itself. And all cardiac surgeons, we don't go on strike. We don't not come in. We're professionals. And so when somebody's sick, What you thought you were going to do is not what you're going to do if you're committed to your profession. Mm -hmm. It's a little different. I can be out, and if I'm on call, I can't have a glass of wine. There may be some patient with a trauma or something that I can't predict. And when I get called or my colleagues get called for an emergency, it's an emergency. And the problem is no one can cover Particularly for pediatric heart surgeons, there's only about 200 of us in the country. And as a result, there's not a lot of redundancy. There's not a lot of depth. Right. And and so when you're the person, you're the person. And that fatigue makes you burn out even when there's not a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Social ridiculousness, social quicksand of social media, and all the crazy things that we're doing to ourselves as a society with guns and other things. Yeah, I agree. 
It's interesting because social media to me can be wonderful. I've been able to meet heart families and heart warriors and people in the heart community all over the world. I've talked to doctors whose papers I've read, which is really exciting. And if we didn't have the internet like we do now, that might never have happened. On the other hand, like you said, there are problems that come along with that familiarity as well. Well, I didn't know you were a founder for Heart Gift. That really impresses me. I know that there's a Heart Gift in Dallas, and you were one of the founders for Heart Gift San Antonio. How do you feel working with patients in your nonprofit differs compared to your regular hospital setting in terms of factors contributing to doctor burnout? You know, in terms of burnout, I'm not sure there's a bunch of difference, but a little about Heart Gift, if I might. Mm -hmm. It was founded by Chip Oswald, who was my father's partner as a heart surgeon in Austin. Chip founded it, thought it was a good thing, and we were the first, if you will, franchise in San Antonio. And Tom Mays, my chief of pediatrics and chief of the critical care unit, and I co-founded it a number of years ago. And I love working on these patients. It gives you great, great satisfaction to bring a kid from some part of the world where they have no chance and to know that you and your board and your colleagues helped take care of these kids and gave them a chance. Probably the most compelling thing that happened is we've had some children from parts of the world where they've been told that Americans are infidels, that -hmm. don't go there, they're going to put your child to sleep and cut their organs out and abandon you and put you in jail. And the tears that are on the mom or pop's eyes when you give them their kid back well and don't ask for a penny. And the goodwill that goes to America from the people they touch when they go back to areas of the world that have been fed lies about what America is about makes it very rewarding and to forget about burnout for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where your passion for what you do really has a chance to come through there in a way that's different than your regular patients might be. Because really what you are is an answer to prayer for so many of those people. Their children would have had no hope if it were not for you and for heart gift. So I can see where that would be really, really rewarding. It really is. Is it the same with Heart Gift that it is with some of these other organizations where not only do the doctors volunteer their time and their expertise and their talents, but they also end up having to pay to go where they need to go to help the children? Or all of the children just flown to San Antonio? So you, most of the people who help you or who are part of your team are right there in San Antonio anyway. We haven't quite made the switch in San Antonio, but I know that the Heart Gift umbrella organization that Dr. Oswald founded is beginning to look at that. And I personally have looked at it. I've been on mission trips to Lima, Peru and Kathmandu, Nepal. I've gone and done operations where I paid for my trip to go there and operate for free, not make any money. And that too is rewarding. But I do think that Heart Gift over the next few years will begin to further leverage what we can do by sending more teams out to try and help teams develop in other countries. The problem with it is sustainability. Mm-hmm. And unless there's a hospital, a non-governmental organization, and a country that has enough of a stable government to allow you to begin to do this work, to go and do a few surgeries somewhere and leave, is not as satisfying as to go and help some people that have rudimentary training compared to what we have in the States and try and take them a little further so they can begin to help kids with heart disease. Right, right. And there are a number of organizations that are doing that, but the need far exceeds what we have available right now. That's absolutely true. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons a few years ago partnered with a company named Edwards that Mm -hmm. contributes I think now almost half a million a year to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons that we then distribute through our foundation to surgical programs in Aliquots of thirty or forty thousand dollars to help send teams to Rwanda, to Nepal, Costa Rica, other places that don't quite have the kind of surgical support we do. And so 
You're correct, Anna. There's only about 15% of the congenital heart disease kids in the world have any chance of getting even a semblance of the treatment we have in the United States or in developed countries. Yeah, we're so lucky here. We are. Do you feel that your hospital or the organizations that you work with are taking any measures to prevent doctor burnout? And if so, can you tell me about that? I think they are. I mean, there are a lot of things that are going on. There started to be some available exercise and balance and meditation programs. There's a great deal of education going on so that the leaders and the rest of the faculty begin to see the signs of it and that each other looks and kind of keeps an eye on signs of it and their colleagues. If somebody's getting a little short or they seem like they're tired all the time or they're just not happy or, you know, they're missing days of work, then we know to intervene and we know to send them home, have them take a day or two off and we'll figure out ways to cover them. So I think absolutely we're all doing that, whether it's University Hospital or UT Health or any of the other facilities in town. I think we're much more aware of just people being tired, being afraid, needing a little time to recharge and figuring out ways to help them do it. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Dr. Calhoun, what do you find to be the biggest stressor in your practice as a doctor? Well, let me answer that, Anna, by saying the easiest thing I do is to go to the operating room. Mm. It's my happy place. I've heard that from so many surgeons. They all say that, that that's their happy place. Yeah, well, it is. It's the place I go where the team's there. They're all there because they either like me or they like what happens or they tolerate me. I don't know, but it's just an enjoyable (laughs) place to be. Mm-hmm. And we leave with a great sense of fulfillment. Mm-hmm. The biggest stressor in the practice has to be the fatigue of trying to identify resources for your team, mm-hmm. trying to deal with the individual problems today. One of my people is in, and his mother's developed dementia, and he's considering mm-hmm. other jobs so he can travel more to see her. And he's a wonderful part of our team. Yeah. Those are the stresses. Sure. The Susie's angry at Billy. That somebody's got a medical problem, the crises within the various employees' family. After being in charge of my group for almost 29 years, it's quite fatiguing to be the person everybody turns to. And on the flip side, it's quite rewarding to be that person and to be able from time to time to help with those problems and feel like you've maybe made somebody's life a bit better. It's almost like you have this huge extended family. It is. I never say the word family at work because I don't want to lessen the family that I have at home. But it is. It's a community of people that I'm the leader of, and I treat them as if they were family, but they're not my family. Mm -hmm. Well, what can we do as a heart community to help prevent Dr. Burnout? This one's pretty easy for me. This is a golden rule thing. Just remember, doctors aren't perfect. And when your doctor's a little afraid or a little upset, take a moment and say, are you okay, doc? Are you a little whipped? Are you a little tired? And give them a chance to respond. Because most physicians, when read it, they'll say, you're right. I'm sorry. I needed to give you a little more time. I'm being a little 
impatient. I can do better. Or, no, I'm really tired. Could I see in a week? Could I do this a different time? Just understand that occasionally we come waltzing in there like nothing's going on at all. And we've had three board meetings and four people having all kinds of crises in their life. And there may be a kid hanging on for dear life in the unit. And we've got a lot of things in our mind and we do our best to be calm and collected and in control of ourselves, but we're not always perfect. So I would say just trying to be empathetic with your physician. I think as a community beyond that, you can't. That's for the doctor to manage. That's for them to recognize and carve out that time we've been discussing about for this session. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you say that practicing the golden rule with your doctor it's weird because on the one hand, a lot of us put you all up on a pedestal. You saved our children's lives. And especially for the parents, we treat you almost as though you're God. Those are pretty tough shoes to fill. <laughs> but on the They're other impossible. hand, yeah, it is impossible. On the other hand, you're right. The parents are really stressed out. But yeah, you doctors are also really stressed out. So that doesn't always lend itself to the best kind of communication or the best interactions because you're not at your best. And with this pandemic, I'm sure it's been even worse because at least when I was in the hospital with my baby 28 years ago, my husband could be there by my side. My mother and father could be there. My sister could be there. And during the pandemic, you weren't allowed to have anyone. All correct. I think, Anna, that people need to recognize that physicians, nurses, other healthcare providers are not a deity. We're just like them. We're human. And we have our failings and shortcomings. And we don't always have a perfect day. Right. But if somebody can take a deep breath and give their physician or healthcare provider a chance to rebound, they may find that they do have the right physician and maybe that physician was having a bad moment. And for me as a physician, when I have bad moments, and I have them, nothing's better than somebody saying, hey, doc, looks like you're having a rough go. Do you take a deep breath? And we talk about this in a minute. Doesn't happen often. I'm pretty good at this now. But I do recognize when I'm getting tired and do recognize when others are tired and things are escalating and they just need to de-escalate. And again, trying to be a little more spiritual, trying to have a little more golden rule in you, you have to presume that everybody has virtuous intent. Yes. It doesn't mean that everything comes out of your mouth is virtuous. Right. But the intent is there. You wouldn't be a doctor if you didn't want to do good for others. Absolutely. Well, you've been practicing as a doctor for decades. How has the medical community changed in their treatment of doctor burnout? You've seen the field of pediatric cardiology change. And so I'm sure you've seen the way the medical field treats doctor burnout change over the years, too. Well, I think that burnout's a relatively new term, but fatigue, practicing when you're too tired, staying up too many hours, are all things that the profession has addressed particularly in the educational arena, although it's beginning to occur in the practice arena. In the educational arena, where I've had a lot of leadership roles, over the last two and a half decades, we've created work hours for residents where they can work so many hours, they can be up so many hours, they can take so much call. When I was an intern, I was on call every other night and up all night every other night for five months. And there were two or three times where I was up all night, two nights in a row, and it was dangerous. I looked at yeah. some of the notes I wrote on the second night, and I couldn't read them. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, we fixed that. And so we're not letting people practice when they're too tired to practice. And my partners and I have fixed it because if I get called in tonight and I'm up all night and I have a case the next day, I just tell them, hey, I'm taking a nap. I'm not doing that case until I've had my nap. We're going to start at 10 or 11. We're not starting at 7. Mm. And, and those are things we can do to affect the physical part of just being too tired to work. Mm -hmm. But it's part and parcel of the burnout thing, too, which is 
doing that too many times in a row, trying to bring your best game too many times in a row when you're just bombarded with this problem and that problem and this problem and that problem and you can't seem to get done with your day and your day runs into your night. We've begun to realize that that actually does create burnout and people actually do want to retire or seek something else. We haven't yeah. really addressed the electronic medical record. It's mm-hmm. been a boon. It's been wonderful. It allows us to codify the patient's problems and collate them in a way we never could before and get a hold of them easy. But at the same time, it's like we were laughing for this podcast. You're having to find how to do a software, mm-hmm. figure out how to deal with this particular thing and play this particular computer program's game mm-hmm. to create a record that someone can read and use. So we've learned the things that cause burnout. We've begun to address them. We'll never get done because being a physician is a profession. And being a profession means that occasionally you have to get up when you're tired and come to work and do your best. Right. Wow. It's interesting what you said about the medical record because my husband is a nurse and they decided to start using Epic at his hospital. And it was not a quick transition. It was a slow transition. And the way that it's used for one department may not work well for another department. The coding is not necessarily transferable. So they had different volunteers who offered to help work with the software company so that it would be as seamless as possible to have them transition. And Frank actually volunteered because he was not good with computers. He said, if you can help me to do this so that I understand it, then I'll be able to help others. And he said, I'll be one of the worst ones <laughs> working with the program. And it was a real challenge for him. And it was a real challenge, especially for any of the older nurses that he worked with, because it was so different than the way they had been doing things previously. We switched to Epic in our hospital about four years ago, and it is a huge endeavor. And uh, I want to say the entire conversion to Epic was a $200 million deal. Wow. Our medical school switched to Epic several years ago before that. They're not quite the same Epic. They don't quite talk to each other as you outlined. Mm -hmm. And again, $150, $200 million rollout. It's very well orchestrated, but it is very fatiguing. And yeah. Epic itself is great for many things, but not necessarily great for the physician wanting to write a quick note. Exactly. Exactly. And mistakes are made. Silly kind of mistakes can be made. For example, one of my doctor prescribed some medicine for me. And when I got to the pharmacy, the pharmacist came forward and said, this can't be right because it was a medicine that started with the same letter. And I think it was the medicine right above the one that my doctor wanted for me to have, but the one that mm-hmm. was written was for men. <laughs> so it clearly was not for me. And it required, well, help. it was not going to help me with my problem. <laughs> and I think it's just little things like that, though, that can be frustrating when the wrong medicine is prescribed or Things just don't go according to plan. It would have been so much easier just to scribble on a notepad what the medicine was and for me to take it into the pharmacy like we used to do. Things are really different now. I would agree. I would say that electronic medical records on balance have been a great advantage to healthcare. But teaching old dogs new tricks is never easy and getting them to do it right is never easy. And to your point, Epic prompts you. And so if you type in the first three letters and aren't paying attention, it's no different than spell check or your Mm -hmm. iPhone typing something up for you and anticipating what the word you were putting in is. And if you're not paying attention, it'll put in the wrong word. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been very informative. Thank you so much for coming on the program today, Dr. Calhoun. And I had a great time. It's good to catch up with you. And thanks for all you've done to help the kids and their families with heart disease. It's been something that's been needed, and it's a resource that everyone benefits from. Oh, thank you so much for saying that. I don't know if I would have been brave enough to do it without your help. So (laughs) it's been definitely a great time for me to have gotten to know you and the other people that worked with you. Your team has been wonderful. And because you saved my child's life, 
I felt like God gave me Alexander and a mission, and that mission was to help others. So it's all because of you. <laughs> so thank you. Well, I'll never be able to thank you enough for what you and your team did saving my son's life. Really proud of our team, and we're always humbled to be able to help someone. We're always thankful when it goes well, and always prayerful on the few times it doesn't. Absolutely. Well, friends, if you've enjoyed this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna, please consider becoming a patron of our program for the cost of a pizza. You could be a patron for an entire year. We have all kinds of benefits for those who would like to support the program. Just head on over to our Patreon. That's www.patreon.com slash heart to heart. And you can learn more and be part of our team. That does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have become inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard at any time, wherever you get your podcasts. A new episode is released every Tuesday from noon Eastern time.